Hey guys, True Grit Scott. Looking to make a quick video. I've done chainsaw milling videos and some of the stuff that I use, whether it's an oiler, the winch, and I've done some videos, but I usually do them really quick at the end of what I'm doing, just a quick shot. So I've had enough people ask me at this point if I could do kind of a little more in depth and explain it. I use it every day, so in my head, it's really clear but apparently just because it's clear in my head doesn't mean it's clear in your heads and that I'm conveying what I want to convey. So I'm going to pause you a couple times. I'm going to zoom you in. And I really think this is a video that might wind up having to be parts spliced together, which would be some new tech for me to actually edit a video. Anyhow, what I'm going to you can see my truck, we've been doing firewood. So you can see it's pretty much full of uh, bark off of all the dead ash we have here in Pennsylvania. It's bark's falling off of everything. And uh, I'm gonna zoom you in, I'm gonna show you a couple things. The first thing I'm gonna show you is kinda how I set up my winch. And I'm not totally happy with some of the all-in-one winch kits that are out at the moment. Uh, you know, they come with an aux oiler and a winch and all of that stuff. I'm, I don't like them. They're, they're not made right. And I'm hoping to work with Neotech on getting out a better piece of kit. They just are releasing their chainsaw mills. I have one coming this week. Uh, I had talked early on with them about, you know, what's good, what's bad. So guess we'll see. Anyhow, I'm going to pause you guys. I'm going to zoom in and we're going to get a look at some of this stuff. First things first, guys, we're going to do some chainsaw milling 101 stuff. This is a saw that's actually a 99cc milling saw. It's getting shipped out. So it has dogs on it that you can see. Generally on my milling saws, I like to get that extra two inches. So those dogs wouldn't be on this saw. Let me see if I can find a pointer. Anyhow, those dogs wouldn't be on this saw. They'd be off of it just to give me that extra space. But if you're a fellow who's using his milling saw for other things, maybe you leave your dogs on. So one of the things that I was talking about is this is this is my small mill. It's a 48 inch mill. OK, now with that 48 inch mill, when you set it up on a bar, you're going to lose six inches. If you didn't have the dogs, you're going to lose a little more with the dogs. And what I wanted to show folks is when you're clamping the mill onto the bar, I go past those rivets. There's rivets over here because what happens is you have your sprocket tip and that sprocket tip doesn't end at the end of the bar. It goes, th those teeth for the sprocket go up into the chain halfway. So I've seen people put this clamp on tighten it down and then the sprocket won't turn and they think they're having a problem with their saw and you know they'll figure it out kind of quick but i always put it behind the rivets that way i know i can't be hitting that sprocket but in that you probably lose from here to there is got to be four and a half inches then on this end again the dogs normally wouldn't be on the saw but depending on the depth of your cut so here i'm at I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six or six and a half inches. It clears the chain break. But if I was cutting something a little bit thinner and this top rail was down a little bit, it could hit the chain break. So sometimes you do have to leave space, not as much as with these dogs in between the, the clamp for the mill jig and the saw. You know, a lot of times I'll leave a half inch or a fingers width there just so that the chain break doesn't hit if I'm doing something, you know, thinner slabs. So you have to keep that in mind and it depends on, on how you're working. Other thing is I see guys with, you know, this is, this is a regular handle or a heavy duty handle on this saw, but a full wrap or a half wrap or, or, or actually a three quarter wrap isn't good on a milling saw because it comes down at the bottom of the saw and it'll hit the ground depending on how you're milling and it gets in the way and there's no reason for it. So that's kind of that stuff. What else I wanted to show you guys is how I set up the winch. I'm gonna pause you and I'm gonna get it on video so I could just show you real easy. Okay guys, this is the cheapest winch I could find on Amazon. I think it's $24 shipped to my door. What I wind up doing with this winch 
is it comes, well, it comes in pieces. You got to put two pieces together like this. And there's a nut on the end of this. I lost it for my other one. So I took the nut off of this one. But what I wind up doing is the piece that's holding the spool, the, the bolt that's holding the spool right here. I buy one that's maybe an inch or two longer than this one is. I'll go into the grinder. I'll grind this head of the bolt down so it'll fit into the T-slot. Let me put this back in there because I will lose it if I don't. Come on. Can't get it in the hole. Give me a second here, guys, and I'll show you. Maybe I can edit some of this stuff out. Oh, wrong one. This guy here. So the way this goes on is right in my T-track. I have the winch, put it right on. This is the bolt with the head moved down and it's a little jammed up in there because there's junk. But then that bolt floats into your T-slot. You just throw your winch on it and you can kind of put it wherever you want. Now, some guys get crazy with this, with how they want it mounted and everything else. But what I find is I throw this guy on here and I just, I have paracord on this one. I don't know that I love the power paracord because it has, or 550 cord, whatever you want to call it. It has a little bit of stretch to it that maybe sometimes I like as I'm milling and sometimes I don't. So maybe something a little heavier might be nice. But there's a bolt that, that goes through the handle here and the head of it prevents this from spinning too much. So yeah, it's free floating. Yeah, it's kind of loose. But for just when it's got tension on it and you're cranking, it's fine. And if I'm moving this around, I can, it's in there now, but you can slide it wherever you need it to be, which is kind of nice. Uh, the other thing that I do, and hopefully this is all in video. Yeah, you can see that, I believe. I throw another little bolt in there that I take the end of my paracord. So say I'm using the ladder. I'll run that down to the end of the ladder, then all the way back, and I connect it to this bolt that I can then move wherever I want it. You could connect it to the handle if that's what you like. There's more than one way to skin that cat, have something hanging off of here you could secure it to. That's pretty much the winch setup in a nutshell, and it's really easy. I see guys, I either use a first cut rail. Here, let me pause you a second and talk to you guys. I generally use either a first cut rail or a ladder for every cut, not just my first cut. And the reason I do that is because, yes, the top of your log is flat and the mill will sit on it wonderfully. The problem that I have is sliding the mill, the aluminum, across, you know, that surface of the log as opposed to two aluminum rails that slides really nicely on. So I'll either use the first cut rail or the ladder for every single cut that I do keeps everything nice and once you get used to doing it it's it's not really a lot of extra work to do it you have it there and i think it just makes it nicer especially on your entrance to the cut you have that overhang of either your ladder i'll just i'll use ladder here that you have the overhang so you can rest your mill on it as you're going into the cut and then you have ladder hanging off the end of the log that helps you at the end of your cut you know you could set the saw there get up dust yourself off then grab the saw off the ladder Whereas if you don't use the ladder on every cut, when you're at the end of that log and you come out of it, you're out of it. And when you're going into it, it's real easy to wiggle and get a funny cut going into it. You can make it perfect, but you're gonna work at doing it. Next thing I'm gonna to talk to you guys about is the aux oiler. People go nuts and people are gonna argue about this and people have different opinions about this. To me, I, I do a simple setup with an aux oiler. It's a little piece of PVC. It's got a cap on the top. It's got a cap on the bottom. I drill a hole in the bottom and I put whatever valve I have handy. This is actually a valve from an air compressor. I'll zoom you guys in here as I'm talking about it. This is actually a valve from an air compressor. So maybe you weren't even in the frame. Top cap, piece of PVC. Drill a hole in the bottom, thread it in a little piece of pipe that I had. It was like compressor hose pipe for something. And then I uh, threw some JB Weld on it just to make sure it stayed in. Little valve, 
and that's got to be quarter of inch hose that I'm using. And the reason I use that is I use recycled French fry fry oil from the diner down the road in my chainsaw mill. And the reason I do that is because, listen, bar oil is wonderful, but fry oil, I'm recycling it, number one. It smells good like French fries as a milling, number two. And the problem with that is dogs want to come up and lick up the chips sometimes. But for lubrication on a bar, I mix it with diesel. I put a little bit of diesel in it, which <laughs> the dogs still want to lick that. But just to keep it uh, thin in the winter. And it is good enough for lubrication. I've been doing it with bars from 28-inch bars up to 72-inch bars. I don't have a problem with bars wearing by using fry oil. Um, is there better oils out there? Yes. Do I need a crazy engineered oil to run a chain over a bar? Like I'm, I have some high performance German car with, you know, such tight tolerances in a piston and cylinder that I have to have the best oil in the world. No, it's a chain sliding in a groove. So I have it with a zip tie on here you can't hardly see because of all the sawdust and it just holds it and it drips and i control that drip with the valve and because i'm using fry oil and it's free i could drip it on there as heavy as i want what i do not like about the fry oil is that it will it makes a mess and it gets dirty and it gets sticky on some of this stuff and i've never wiped this in years clean this off it, it is what it is but what i did i have been using this bar it's just a little 36 inch bar and i had been using it and i was real curious if that stuff was going to come off easy and i had some gasoline on a rag wipe wipe it all came off so can you clean it up yes pretty easy but it does make more of a mess than real bar oil does but again it's free and it's not 15 dollars a gallon uh talk to you real quick about these i don't know that these quick adjusts are wonderful, yet I haven't milled enough wood with bigger bars to say yet. And the reason I'm saying that is, yeah, they work fine. Like adjusting this thing is, is absolutely wonderful with these, but I want to really pull a big chain and have that saw vibrating like crazy for a full day of milling that it doesn't move at all before I'm going to tell anybody this setup is wonderful. I just don't know yet. It seems okay, but I don't know. I am trying to think of what else to talk to you guys about. I might cut it short for that. Oh, here, here's a neat little thing. For, you know, adjusting the mill as you're working, these Milwaukee ratchets, and you could probably get away with some cheap no-name ratchet, are absolutely wonderful. And I just keep, before I started using these guys, you know, you have the, what the heck do you call them? They're not nuts. Oh, threaded rod joiner couplers on there to tighten it. Well, there's one on the other side. Here, I'm going to show you a coupler. You know, these guys here, the couplers, that maybe somebody calls a long nut, but really they're couplers. Uh, anyhow, to tighten those, I just have two different ones. I have the half inch to adjust the, you know, if I'm pulling the thing out of the mill, and then I'd have a deep well socket to do those. It's a short one, so it's not going to fit on there, but deep well will. Hopefully I don't need them anymore because these are going to work real well and I'll probably find out later today how good they are. In a nutshell, that's a quick video. I don't have much else to tell you. I'll say goodbye to you guys. Anyhow, guys, that's the beginning of some chainsaw milling stuff. I'm going to go into more as I'm thinking about it and try to edit this together in a reasonable way. But for a quick video, just to show somebody how we set that up and how we do the oiler, I think that's enough information if it's not just just hit me hit me in the comments even uh hit me on facebook bulletproof saws on facebook too anyhow true grit scott bulletproof saws thanks for watching stay safe